So, like, if a movie's come out, you ask that friend, oh, hey, what'd you think of the movie? And if they're like, oh, I hate it, Super Friends is terrible, you have a choice. You can be like, well, that's a good thing to keep in mind when I go, and so I will manage my expectations. You can go, um, oh, that sounds really bad. I want to see it. And you can have your own experience. But what I don't want you to get to do is listen to me and then go, oh, well, she must be wrong. It must be the most fantastic movie ever. And then you go, and your eyes are bleeding out of your head, and you're like, why did I go see Gods of Egypt? <laughs> you don't have to trust that. You don't, I mean, you don't have to take our word as gospel. But you should. You <laughs> but at least keep it in mind. Does anyone read reviews after they see a movie? Yeah. Nice. That works. Nice. God bless you people. Uh, yes. <laughs> you're, you're my people. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start taking questions because I, because I have a thought and I need to percolate it for a second. You start. Um, something Kyle mentioned earlier about is a critic really going to deter someone from going or not going to seeing this movie? Or, you know, is it, is it really, are they trying to? Are they trying to say, okay, here, you should go see this movie, you should go see this movie, and, and that's not really your job, you're just trying to. One of my problems is Steve Sahls. Sorry. Sales. Sales. Yeah. 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 Sorry. Um, for the most part, except for the actual ones everybody knows, <laughs> if he doesn't like it, I run right out and see it. Because it probably is pretty good. He's just. And you know? Then he's doing you a service. Yeah, that's yeah. it. And you know, that works, that works as a philosophy, too. I even have critics where they're like, where I'll read it and they'll be like, and they're keywords you can hear in reviews. Like if they say something's pedantic or just um, too cliched, I'm like, oh, that'll be fun. Because well, they have used those words. Yeah, but the thing is, is that, well first, find a critic who has a, a similar mindset to yours, because except for the ability to talk endlessly about movies, we're all very different. We all have very different interests, we all have very different outlooks on life, we all have very different buttons that will drive us crazy no matter how good a movie is. <laughs> like that. <laughs> like an episode where you do. We're like long lost siblings. It's very tragic. Okay. But you will try, like, find a critic, if you find a critic whose outlook matches yours more closely, you will trust them mm -hmm. more than you trust, like, say, Steve Sells, who clearly has very different opinions than you on certain movies. But uh, if I can also say, also, find a critic whose writing you actually like to read. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> most, of, most of the things I review are things that you probably never can never going to see, you, you don't want to, and that's fine if you enjoy reading the review. There are reviewers that I know I share their tastes, but I can't stand to read their reviews. I just don't like their style. <coughs> so also look at the review, not just as your signpost for what should I see this weekend. Read the review. Buy, buy a book of Roger Ebert reviews knowing you're not going to use it as a checklist just because you like actually reading how the man puts words in a sentence. I apparently have a small but fairly loyal collection of plus 60 readers who never go out and see movies but enjoy reading my reviews of the movies they're never going to see because they like experience them in a small degree and I'm like, okay, whatever keeps you reading. Let me, let me put it this way. Let me put a question to the, the panel here. Um, what, what do you think the utility of a negative review is? How, how, how is it, how's a negative re review helpful? And I, 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 I ask this question in the context of the movie quote that we all know probably by heart, although I had to look it up to, remember, to remind myself, uh, that you know, the bitter truth that we critics must, must face is that in the grand scheme of things, the average piece of junk is probably more meaningful than our criticism designating it. So, quick, who knows the, who knows where that's from? Ratatouille. Ratatouille, Anton Ratatouille, Ratatouille, Anton Ego's review. Well, two things. I think first, sometimes, I like, I do, when I write a really bad review, I do sometimes try to save people. Because like I wanted to defend the most recent Fantastic Four so hopeful, and it was emotionally scarring. If I can save somebody the kind of like fangirl freefall I experienced during that movie, don't leave us. During which movie? 
Fantastic Four. Then I considered, I like that was what I was hoping for. Two, negative reviews are hilarious. Yes. There's a there's a review on IO9 after the Transformers sequel called Michael Bay finally made an art movie. I reread it even now. It is one of the most entertaining pieces of text I have ever found. It's go find it. Just type in that title. I'm, I'm going to be a little bit of a contrarian about that because yes, it's true, but I think that is what perpetuates the idea in readers that we like not liking things because we like being able to pull out that razor pen and write our saucy put down. And I mean, I think we, you know, as many of us do, we follow all of our fellow critics on Twitter and you see this sort of intense, like, what is it with people? Why can't they, you know, why are they so mean to us? But, well, okay, you know, we can be thick skinned about it. But at the same time, you have to understand that, you know, there's a reason to write something and it's not just to feel better because I spent two hours in there and now they're gonna suffer because I suffered. <laughs> you're, not actually, you're not actually serving your readers, that's just serving yourself. And it's cathartic and it's, you know, it has its value, but you, you better be thinking about the fact that someone's gonna read that and think you're just trying to take it out on that movie that you didn't like instead of saying, okay, let's process this in a way that's actually meaningful and helpful in some way. But, but if your review is also entertaining, then you can say, the only good thing that has come out of this bad movie is this hilarious review of it. Um, you probably don't know a fellow named Ken Beck who writes at jabutu.com, and he writes insanely long, I think his, his review of Superman 4 was 25,000 words. Wow. Yeah, yeah. His, his reviews are routinely longer than the scripts would have been. <laughs> um, but they're wonderful to read because he's a wonderful writer. He likes to take apart and, and show exactly where a movie doesn't work, but he's also so damn funny. So, you know, some of the, you know, the only good thing that came out of Superman 4 is Ken Beck's review of it. But I, something Scott said I would like to emphasize, I wanted to love Batman vs. Superman. This was not me going in prepared to rip it. I am a bat girl from like very young. I, I am such a nerd, I want to go in and be so dazzled that I will have trouble writing an intelligent review. That is my goal every time I go into one of these comic book movies. So the fact that I was so upset by the tribute of Superman, it broke my heart. Uh, and I had a great time in it, so I don't know what she's talking about. But it's because he has no taste. Oh, but um, to that to that idea about bad reviews, there are a couple movies I've seen where I I not only want to warn the general public, hey, if you have like an evening to spend, and this is your one night you're going out on a date, and oh, you're working it out, and don't waste it on this movie. Don't waste your money on this movie, and I also don't want that kind of movie made again. I want it to bomb. Yes, I don't want the give studio, it more money. Yeah, I want the studio to go, well, that, that sucked. <laughs> and then to think twice when they go to make that kind of movie again. I'll admit, if it's bad, I'll do that. But I really don't go into a movie going, well, Zack Snyder, well, let's see, and, and I don't, yeah. So. But uh, I think in, in my case, uh, I do online reviews, but I also do television reviews. My time on television is very limited. The last thing I really want to do is talk about a bad movie on television if I have 90 seconds to talk about movies. Um, sometimes I have to talk about the movie because it's the biggest movie that week, and so you go with it. But I hate, I hate to do a bad review. Um, there are thousands of people who work on a film. Um, some of them, that's their first film and their only film because it was an awful movie and it's not their fault. So when I go in and, and I don't like a movie, it, it, it hasn't, I mean, it, it drains me, to be honest with you. It would be great, it would be fantastic if every movie we saw was fantastic. Mm -hmm. It would. If we, if we didn't have to write negative reviews on anything, uh, I would be, I'd be happy. We wouldn't exist, actually. But, yeah. We probably wouldn't <laughs> exist, but that's okay, because we could still talk about how good like. things were. But, and you're trying to find the silver lining, you know, yeah. I mean, in a bad mood, it's like, well, you know, the, uh, the titles were great. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, credits were really legible, and... The that script did such excellent work. He was really key. And the bad nipples were awesome. <laughs> <laughs> You, you pepper, you pepper the, the negative with something good, uh, or the good with something negative. 
so they don't accuse you of being biased? Well, yeah, I, I guess, you know, I, uh, I wrote for a website which is now no longer there because of a stupid <laughs> server accident. And the backups that they said. Video. Yeah, well, the backups that they said they were doing daily, <laughs> they weren't. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so the website's not there. But for a dozen years, I did long, complete reviews on my own of B movies. And after a dozen years, you're right, I finally burned out when I realized that I had just seen the first Leprechaun, <laughs> and I had the four Leprechaun movies set there, so three more, and I'm like, or I could be doing something else with my life. <laughs> and I haven't reviewed since because I've, I've burned out on that negativity. On the other hand, I get people coming up to me all the time, like, when, are you come, when are you coming back? Dude, that was hilarious. I love, when are you doing Leprechaun 2? But, you know, so there's, you know, there's a, a falling on the grenade sensibility to it sometimes. I'm gonna save you from it and you'll enjoy what comes out of it. But, yeah, it does, I guess it does get wearing being negative for so long. Okay, take this question, or try, try this out for size. Um, a movie that you walk into with some degree of hope that disappoints versus a movie that you walk into fully expecting to be garbage and it slightly surprises. It's not, not as bad as you thought. Which one gets the better review? And I mean, I mean, this is a very hypothetical sort of situation, I realize, but how, how do you balance the, the, slight, the slight surprise versus the mild disappointment? Well, um, I find that the one that pleasantly surprises me, even only a little, tend, I tend to be kinder in the review, though we do try to wait at least a little, at least a couple of hours after every screening, because honestly, if I, if I put pen to paper, just as I left the, left the theater, I would be like 100 times meaner. But um, what I really try to do with movies is I try to look, not even really so much at my expectations, but at what they try to be. So I will give more points to just, to just like a, a throwaway popcorn thriller that was actually quite entertaining, more than this like big, grand, deep, serious epic that made me lose consciousness halfway through. Because even though the other movie is less important, it successfully met its goals, and most importantly, it managed to entertain its audience. I, I'm actually quite forgiving of the movie if it manages to be entertaining, because that's what I feel is the major goal of it, particularly a whole section of movies. If it rewards the two hours and the like 12 bucks of movie ticket you gave it, with a nice time, sometimes that's all you need from a movie. Well, I mean, I think along, along the same lines that there is there is a comparison, there should be a, a, a distinction between something that is, in theory, aspiring. You know, we, we know, as critics know, that a certain time of year in fall, it's prestige, it's Oscar movie time. And they'll trot out their, you know, great person biopics, and, and we'll sit there dutifully, and, you know, you know that if you've had a really great hot dog, that's better than having a really crappy steak. And so these things may be trying to be a gourmet meal, but if it's a lousy gourmet meal, I'd rather have the hot dog. I'd rather have something that's, that isn't necessarily being ambitious, but is doing what it's trying to do so much better than anything. I will watch Tremors a thousand <laughs> times before I, I watch The Fury of Everything one second. <laughs> If I can get surprised by a movie, even, even a little, if it's better than I expected it, even if I didn't expect anything, it's, it's always going to come out uh, a little more kind. Uh, I, I'm probably going to be a little more flattering uh, simply because of that element of surprise. And that's maybe not fair, but they're my review, so that's the way it is. <laughs> um, I want to talk. I want to ask. Oh, I was just going to say to Scott's point that I, I, I try to review movies based on what I, at least I think the movie's trying to do. So oftentimes someone will come up and say, "Hey, is this movie better than insert their favorite movie here?" And I'm going, "Those are two completely different kind of movies." But mm -hmm. is it? 
is it a comedy? And did it make me laugh? Then okay, you know, is it is it a is was it, it a non comedy that made you laugh? That's the bad <laughs> part. I didn't know that it was yeah that kind of thing. Yeah, so, getting, back, getting back to the theory of everything. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And there's some of those movies where you're going, oh, do they know how hilarious this is? I don't think they do because. This is listed as political drama. <laughs> and so, or, yeah. the, or the Danish girl. Uh, there you go. And I, and I believe that something like uh, Starship Troopers, uh, when they made it, they didn't even realize what they were doing at the time. I think even the filmmakers were going, no, we thought we were making a pretty serious action flick here. But it turns out they didn't realize how tongue in cheek the whole thing was. And then later, everyone went, that's hilarious. And they're like, no. I, I think they knew how fast. I don't. It was. I don't doubt for a moment that Paul Verhoeven knows exactly what he's doing when he's making that movie. Well, yeah. no. I, there's a whole. There's a whole thing online about that they were going. Oh no, we were trying to make a serious. I, I know. This, this is the guy who made RoboCop, and you're telling me he doesn't know how to make a. I'm telling you, look at the internet, Bob, and check it out. Oh, look at the internet. Okay. All right. It's on the internet. You got me there. It's not here. It must be true. But that's my point. Is is that some movies don't even know what they're doing, and so sometimes. It works for you, but that's not even Which, what they intended. It's like a seal song. Which is why Plan 9 from Outer Space works as a comedy mm -hmm. a lot. You know, a, bad bad movie, a bad movie can still be a good comedy. A bad comedy can't be anything. <laughs> um, a since, lesson. Since we mentioned the internet, I, wanted, I want Scott to, to talk a little bit about the, the grand adventures of Rotten Tomatoes. <laughs> um, he's wearing the shirt. Um, <laughs> You, you had you had you had an interesting experience just this month with the movie Zootopia, which got which currently rides with a 99 percent positive rating on on Rotten Tomatoes. Two critics in the entire in all of North America gave it a gave it a green splat, and I'm sti I'm sitting next to one of them. Let me let me clarify. Rotten Tomatoes gives it the green splat. They look at the review and they decide what it is. Now I'm not they after all of the crap storm that came. I gave what was basically a two and a half star B minus review. Not glowingly positive. It was not something I loved. And that was, and I didn't know until a couple of days later and I started getting this like, why is this review trending so much? I don't have no idea. And suddenly it's like, oh, it's because it's one of two that Rotten Tomatoes said was negative. And suddenly I was public enemy number one in the entire <laughs> Disney universe, which is kind of a problem since I've written a book about Disneyland and I'm hoping it actually <laughs> does well. But this is what happens is there's this fascism of the number on Rotten Tomatoes and, and the people who saw that splat did not think for a moment, well maybe it shouldn't have been, because there were actually, and I went to see, believe me, other two and a half star reviews that were not given the green splat and think, well maybe that should have, and, and, I, and, they, and Rotten Tomatoes went to me, so should we change it? And I said, no, screw them, I don't, I don't, I'm not gonna change, have you change anything just because I got heat, because I can take the heat, although it was more heat than I was expecting. <laughs> but there was just this bizarre sensibility that, you know, how dare someone change the 100%, even though I really kind of did, the other negative review was actually negative. And yet you still have this thing where because it's the splat there and everyone loves that movie, then, you know, here come the swords. And I will say, one thing that one attitude the critics do seem to share is if you want to yell at them for their negative opinion, we will just have it harder. We, it, like, we, we're all open for polite discussion or even friendly argument. But if you like yell at us because you don't feel we have the right to the opinion, we get really stubborn. Okay, um, we're going to open it up to some questions here. Ooh, uh, I do one, John. Just name one. Okay, go ahead. I had a similar experience with Star Wars, the, 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 the Force again. And I gave it a, a B or B minus, something like that. Still pretty good. I mean, I got through high school with Bs. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> the hell's wrong with a B? But Bs are massive grade. Yeah. You just thought about it. Punched a baby on national television. It was amazing. <laughs> These are. You know what you're talking about? And I was like, oh, okay, all right. So, hey, Richard, but, I, I gave the film a four out of five on that. It got attacked yeah. on radio locally. So, yeah. you know, I mean, it's, it's yeah. crazy. But I did not like this movie. I, 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 once, I, I, once got, yourself? I once got angry mail against Disney audiences because I gave Lion King three and a half and not four. Mm. Right. So. I, I mean, I think it's interesting that, that they'll hassle you for a three and a half. Rather, and I don't get a whole lot of hassles for the ones and a half. But, 
Three and a half for Star Wars. Oh well. It was the A. Kids cry over A minuses. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh well. Okay. In the blue in the back. I'm curious about do you go fresh into the movie every time you came into the movie? Do you try to go into the history of the show or the after? Or do you try to find out what you can? Well. How much research going in? Ryan, how about you, uh, Ryan, why don't you start? Uh, you know, it, it, a lot of times, I mean, it depends on the movie. Uh, certain movies, they're directed by people we already know their history. Uh, a lot of the times, we're looking at, you know, it's a, if it's a new director, if it's a new film, I like to go in blind. Um, if I have questions about the movie, maybe then I'll go back and I'll look and I'll look into something. But uh, I don't want my opinion or, you know, I, I, I prefer not to see a trailer. If I can avoid trailers, it would be great, but unfortunately at a lot of the screenings we're at, we get trailers. Um, but there are other films, I mean, sometimes if it's a based on truth or, you know, I mean, they're, they're, it, it varies, but personally, I'd, I'd rather go in blind and judge it on what it is rather than any sort of <coughs> preconceived idea. Going in blind is, is absolutely the best way to go. Uh, I hate trailers. I mean, I love watching trailers, but I really hate the tra that trailers are out there and that you can see them without wanting to. Uh, they cause more of a problem for me than researching a movie, seeing who wrote it, who's directing it, who's in it. Uh, because I'm not seeing and I'm not hearing. I'm just, I have a list of information that doesn't help me form an opinion. So I would, I would absolutely go in blind as much as I possibly could. I, I actually find myself almost researching more after I've seen the movie as I'm writing the review because uh, I don't really research in advance unless like a, a movie is really based off like the hype of a particular director. But then again, generally I've seen all those other movies so I don't experience. But sometimes research will help me answer like my own questions because last fall's Victor Frankenstein. Complete popcorn movie. It's on some levels really nonsense. I loved it. And I was trying to figure out why I loved it. Because I could not, like, my, like my critic brain was just like, I don't know, it was funny. But, um, so, but when I looked Abby something. <laughs> but when I looked up at the when I looked at the director, there were like three or four other movies in his history that I had a similar reaction to, and I went, "Oh, I guess it's just that guy's touch." So I don't really research for like professional reasons, but sometimes personally, I will just to answer questions. So Scott, I want to ask you to actually because you you have taken we discussed this you take a different tack. Um, yeah, I usually try to read, if I know that a movie is based on a book, I try to read the book before I know. And that's, I mean, that's Don't a... do that as an audience, it would be so yeah. sad. It's a, it's a chancy approach, but I also know that a lot of the people coming to that are going to have that experience, and I think it's important to approach it. Not, it wasn't as good as the book, because that doesn't help. That doesn't tell anybody I anything. Mean, it doesn't help the people who read the book, and it doesn't help the people who didn't read the book. But it provides a framework for was there some radical change of direction? Was there, you know, yes. something, you know, an approach that they completely eliminated a character and that was a huge mistake and this is why maybe it should have been two movies instead of one and, you know, all of those things I think are relevant. And there are people who completely disagree and that's cool. That's and, just an approach. And I, I'm one of those people. I mean, I, I, I respect his choice to do that. Um, I learned the hard way uh, when I read uh, Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone and then saw the movie um, and I found myself using the book as a checklist uh, on the film, and it detracted from my enjoyment of the, mo of the movie. Um, I mean, it, 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 it was an instance where it was an easy checklist to do because Chris Columbus was so slavishly you know, redoing the movie, or redoing the book. Um, but I found, I found that it, was, it, was, it, was, it made it harder for me to enjoy the movie that, I was, that was in front of me. And because of that, I wound up not reading any of the rest of the book. Potter books until after I had written my last review of, the, of Deadly Hallows Part 2. Then I got to go back and read all the, the, the books and, and enjoy them all, you know, all over again. I kind of try to split the, the difference if, I, if it's based on a short book. If it's based on War and Peace, I'm not going to do this, but you know, I try to see the movie so that I will form an opinion of the movie as a movie. Then I will read the book so I won't look like an idiot when I write the review. Yeah, again, if I can, if it's a short enough book. 
Yeah. I should I should qualify that by saying I read the first Divergent book and there was no way I was going to read the other ones. Like I, I had an idea of what I was looking for after that. I didn't. So. And I, you know, I, you know, there's sometimes sometimes you cannot avoid the source material. I mean, they made a, you know they're making a Star Trek movie. I know Star Trek. I've seen every Star Trek. Uh, you know, they made the Cat in the Hat. I have read the Cat in the Hat. Um, and, 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 the, and the book and the book was a lot better. <laughs> um, so you know, you you do. You know, there, there are some things you can again you can't avoid. You can't avoid you can't avoid trailers to movies. You can't avoid the massive hype of you know Batman v Superman or or Captain America as it's coming up. You know? Based on the breakfast cereal. Yeah. Yeah. I mean you can't. Yeah. And you and, and you know it's like if you have not seen any pre-information so far about you know Captain America's Civil War, you're living in a cave. And you know, and, and you're not, and and, and you're it's not really, out here. yeah. You're, you're you're not you're not seeing movies anyway, so it doesn't matter. I I try to avoid reading the book before going to see the movie because I want to see the movie as as a movie, and I don't want to keep going in my head. Ah, oh, that wasn't there. But at the same time, not to go all Batman versus Superman on again, but but a lot of folks are upset the, about the way Batman was portrayed, but are going. Did you read the Dark Knight graphic novel? He's really nasty in it. And so, you know, I don't know. Sometimes uh, reading the book helps. Sometimes it hurts. So I try to split the difference as well. Something I try to keep in mind is uh, what makes a good book and what makes a good movie, the kind of information that shared the experience of it, is actually almost diametrically opposite. Like, as the first Harry Potter movie was sort of a really interesting lesson for me in that slavishly transferring a book into a movie actually harms the movie because they're two completely different languages. So I, even if I have an awareness of the book, I try to treat them as sort of separate entities because I think it's more fair to both of them. And of course, some movies are made with the expectation that just about every Especially by the time you get to say the what the thirty fourth Harry Potter, how many were there? <laughs> uh, you know, after they s split them into so many, you know, they they assume if you're going to the theater to see this, odds are pretty good you've read the book. Whereas if you, based on the celebrated novel that nobody's read, translated from the Swahili, you know, <laughs> then then you, the critic realizes, okay, there might be one person in the audience who's read the book, but by and large, the movie is not made for the people who are already familiar. There's actually a, like sort of a rough scale you can use. Every once in a great while you'll see this movie is a true story. If it's based on a story, it, it's going to be mildly faithful. If it's inspired by, they've stolen two character names and one plot. And if it's inspired by true events. If it's inspired by true events, it'll be even less. If they use the words suggested by, they've taken the title. Yeah. Mildly about the civil If you yeah. squint your eyes. Well, and the, you know, another, you know, uh, well, another example is, is, you talk about that inspired by true events, our brand is Crisis which came out last year, that was adapted from a documentary, and um, you know, essentially James Carville became Sandra Bullock. And if you've seen James Carville, that ain't gonna work. So, uh, in the blue hat. Uh, when you're critiquing a movie, what do you look for? That's what I feel like with Batman versus Superman. But that's okay, because two different people are looking at the movie. And, and that's actually the best way. I, once I've had a chance to actually write my own piece, I usually try to go out and read somebody who thought exactly the opposite, or something very different. Not only because I think it makes me a better writer to just sort of expose myself to, well, I'm not expose myself, to, to have a sense, to have a sense for other opinions, but because and, and, not, and also not because I expect I'm going to have my mind changed, but because I think it is important to see how someone, it's basically debate club, anyone who's, who's done debate, who's done, de you have to be prepared to argue both sides. You, and that forces you to understand the arguments on the other side, even if you don't agree with them. You at least have to acknowledge that they are there. And so I think that this kind of gets a little bit, what you're saying is that I don't have to like something the same way someone does, but I have to at least appreciate and at the same time, I, all I can do is try to 
articulate and analyze my own response. And there's, there's, no there's a laboratory way to actually measure quantitatively how good or bad a work of art is, then my review can't, even if I use the words, this is a bad movie, my review can't be taken as meaning I have measured this movie and by an actual objective scale it is bad. It's just I really, really didn't like it and here's why. Or I did like it or I was meh about it, which is, you know, the 80% of movies in the middle where we all go, yeah, it was kind of okay, which is really hard reviews to write because you don't get fire in your belly. I, yeah. I try to be upfront from the very beginning. I sort of write my reviews trying to say, like, this was my experience watching the movie. And I know that my readers are going to be different people, and I try to highlight it from certain things. Like in horror movie, when I write horror reviews, I'm very careful because I'm not a horror fan, but I know that my that the people reading this probably will be horror fans. Are those people crazy. <laughs> yes, but <laughs> not necessarily in a bad way. But that is, so, that's not always that's, that's not always true because I mean, frequently, frequently in any particular genre, um, you know, they have their own sort of subset of critics that they will go to. Yeah. You know, horror, but, horror, horror fans will go read Fangoria or yeah. you know, things like that. You know, but um, I try to break down the experience of watching the movie. Not like, oh, I liked it or oh, I hated it. Because honestly, nobody cares what I like or what I hate. I try to focus on instead, like, this was, they, they, they really focus on the humor. The plot seems very confused. The performance here, it, it's clear he disappeared into the character. This <coughs> actor, however, was clearly 20 years too old for what the role should have been. So I try to remove my own personal opinion. And you can't do that completely, but I try to sort of say, this is what this aspect of it was like, this is what this aspect of it is like. Because like, even when people ask me recommend, for recommendations, I can't just say, oh, this movie is great. Because movies are like a salad bar, and we all have our favorite sections of the salad bar. I try to say, OK, what kind of movie experience are you looking for? This movie is chickpeas. Yeah. So going, going back to the objective scale of the movies, we could get there. We could have an objective scale, but it would actually require all of us agreeing <laughs> on what the scale and what the, what the base measurement is, and that's just not going to happen. Yeah. One of the great. Um, how would you um, reveal uh, the board of the to um, the How do you differentiate between bad and so bad it's good? Well, I just I just tell them. Well, I just tell them. Like the tone of the review is always very different. And honestly, if the movie's so bad it's good, I will probably say, go see this. Make sure it's late. If you're not entirely sober, that's even better. <laughs> but um, I, I, if if, my, if the movie entertains me, even if it's terrible, I will tell people to go see it. If, if my review is all jokes at the movie's expense, that's so bad it's it's good. It's a fun experience. Hey, I watched I watched Star Crash. Anyone seen Star Crash? Star Crash, the, the yeah. best really, really bad Star Wars ripoff ever come out of Italy. Oh, yeah. No, no, with, with Christopher Plummer and David Hasselhoff? Oh, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I'll be on the Had a John, John Sales script. And John Boy. Okay, yeah, that, this was even more entertaining, although it's really, really bad and wasn't meant to be a comedy. But, and then there, you know, if my reviews are this movie made me wish that I had gone blind three hours ago so I wouldn't have had to have seen it, I would put that in there. And I would be trying to be entertaining, but I will also get a message across, save yourself. No, you shouldn't do this. Trained professionals only should see this movie. And even but they only, don't want to. Yeah, and even only if they have their insurance paid up. Uh, I, I think it's pretty clear if, if you're enjoying, if you enjoy the experience of the movie. And that's, you know, again, that's a lot of what the review is. I enjoyed this movie. I did not enjoy seeing this movie. I was watching this movie on DVD and I got up five times to go check the kitchen for something to eat. You know, and then I stopped and made lasagna so that I wouldn't have to go back and turn on the movie. Again. I was watching it on the plane and I walked out. <laughs> I, I have a, a watch check. The amount of times I check my watch during a movie, because if it's really good, I don't even care what time it is. And occasionally I'll be like, okay, they've got a half hour left, that's just enough time for this hero to die and then come magically back from the dead. But if I start checking my watch like every 10 or 15 minutes, that is a sign that it's a terrible movie. Maybe the first first row. Um, I would like to know your opinions on the look is always better than the movie type thing. Like, how do you deal with that? It's not always fun. No, it's not. I, I could give you a list of films that I think are actually better than the books. It's sometimes the screenplays are actually written by the person who wrote the book. The Bridges awesome. of Madison County. Yeah. Uh, Let the Right One In, I think, is a, a, a phenomenal. Yeah. The, the foreign version, particularly, is better than the book, and yet the guy who wrote the book wrote the screenplay. Um, he changed the ending. Film and Dreams, I think, is far better as a movie than as a collection of short stories. Um, the Horse Whisperer. I would well, put on the list. The thing is, as an author, just stepping aside slightly as an author, sometimes. It, may, it makes complete sense to me that sometimes if the author also gets the crack of the script, it would be better. Because most, most authors wish they could have a second chance at their novel. Because the minute they start reading it, they're like, oh, I should have done that. And then Hollywood goes, here, have another chance. 
So, yeah, no, it would be but then, but, then you, but then you wind up with E.L. James writing her own version of Fifty Shades of Grey. Uh, okay, nothing by E.L. James <laughs> is better than no, anything. That is objectively then. The, yes. There's, there's, the, there's the one we can clinically... Yes, yeah, that's the one thing we all agree on. Let's yes. ask no, 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 no. no. The, the, reason that, the reason that The Bridges of Madison County is always my go-to for that question is because there are times when you realize there's the germ of a really good story here, but the prose that this writer's put to it is so bad, I can't get through it. And so when you have someone who takes that and either strips away a lot of the, the, you know, the floor descriptions of someone taking his shirt off, and you know, okay, that's for somebody, it ain't for me. But the story is clearly, there's something buried deep in the story, and, and you know, Clint Eastwood made a great movie of that story, fortunately taking away some terrible prose along the way. But there was a, a one this year that I think we all agreed on, which was The Martian. Yeah. At least most of us agreed on that, that the screenplay in the movie improved upon what, what the original book is. That's really close. That's really close, though. It's, it's, That's, an, it's, it's but, an easier watch than it is a read. Uh, in a book. So this is kind of going back to, um, you're talking about reading the review after watching the movie. Do you guys ever do that? Do you prefer to do that? You do do that. You do it after you've done your own review, or you ever done it before you do your review and maybe change your opinion after. Well, can't, can't read a, I cannot read a review before I've written yeah. mine because I don't want to inadvertently steal a line. I also will sometimes get, uh, I'm, as you can see, I'm younger than a lot of these people, so I have to be very careful not to read their reviews because I will get so <laughs> I will get pressured. I'll be like, Do you really look that old? No. Do you I really want to have I don't look that old. You don't look old. We've actually discussed I, it. I, I will only read another review. But I, after my first draft, I'll read other reviews and say, hey, is there something here that I'm missing telling people about that I've forgotten to? So that after my first draft, when my opinion is fairly solidified, uh, you know, or on occasion you get that, oh, I totally missed that in the movie. And then you go back and write the paragraph of, and I totally missed this in the movie, and thanks to these other reviews for bringing it up. Some of those movies that are middle of the road, and they're, like you said before, about being fired up, sometimes it's so good, it just flows, and sometimes it's so bad that it drips. And, but anyway. But that's, but also, that's also one of the things of the Twitter era, is you can try to avoid reviews, and suddenly I'm on there, it's like, ah! Yeah, so it's hard to avoid them. But I'll often read one just to get myself going for a minute. Like, I'll read it and I go, oh, now that's horseshit. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and then, I mean, Scott, I mean, Scott mentioned the Twitter problem, and like that was the problem for us last week, is we all saw Batman and Superman on Tuesday night. Um, other markets, New York, LA, I think, saw it on Monday night, so that was 24 hours of Twitter hate oh, so blasting at full bore. But the embargo was technically 4 p.m. our time on yeah. Tuesday. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but the other thing is that because this is such an interrelated social media network world, and because the movie review is responsive, especially if, you know, if you've ever... I probably do this a lot more than anyone else. Most of you are concentrating on the new reviews. I do a lot of classic reviews, a found which there are a lot of stuff snakes. Are you saying Free Enterprise is classic? Is no, I'm saying Phantasm <laughs> 2 is classic. Oh, okay. Roger hated it, and Roger hated it, and I've never trusted him as much since. <laughs> but, um, you know, but that's also part of the conversation when you want to say, all right, this is the general tenor of reviews. Here is my alternate take. And you reference the fact that there are other reviews that feel a certain way about a movie. Yeah. Uh, our time is up, unfortunately.